Thank you very much for the intro. Excellent. So thanks, thanks for joining. Um, I'm very excited to talk about today about, uh, about Spark. Uh, about one year ago, I embarked on a journey to build a new data platform. And of course, I chose Spark. And um, you know, the first year of a relationship always has some learnings. And I thought um, I would like to share some of those earnings with you. You may be thinking about moving to Spark yourself or in the middle of a migration from Hadoop or from a data warehouse uh, or whatever you have in between. So um, yeah, my talk is for you, uh, maybe sharing some of those learnings. Uh, quick words about me. Uh, so I'm passionate about data products. I sort of live at the intersection between data science and data engineering. Uh, I'm the head of data for Get Your Guide. But I've also uh, loved to, I like to travel. I moved around. I worked for LinkedIn for about five years, focusing on big data. Did a lot of Hadoop, a lot of relevance work there, um, until I moved on to back to Berlin. To give you some uh, context about the, this mission, because I will be talking about uh, you know my experience at Get Your Guide, so for you to understand a little bit what Get Your Guide is about and what kind of data we have. So Get Your Guide is a, a global marketplace for tours and activities. The kind of data we have are maybe classic from the e-commerce standpoint of user behavior, a lot of transactions, a lot of uh, performance marketing as well, keywords, impression, clicks, but also some unstructured data like um, you know, images or reviews. So my mission was when I started there uh, about a year and a half ago was to sort of develop that new uh, data platform. And our starting point was basically a single data warehouse, maybe a point we are right now and uh, going all the way to using Spark in production, uh, um, you know, 100%. So the way I failed through that journey was I, very much like this lady, um, having a lot of obstacles, um, you know, a lot of new things. I haven't used Spark in production beforehand, so I felt um, I needed to go uh, above those obstacles, and I also needed to do it really, really fast. Um, so. Let's dive in the first section maybe to, to introduce Spark um, and a little bit of, about what Spark, uh, you know, how he has penetrated the, the space. But before that, to, to kind of remind you, give you some context, um, I'm sure you have very similar goals, but basically our goals um, is to transform data into, into decisions, to be able to explore the, uh, uh, data in an in interesting way, making analysis, um, so being very easy, very nimble, but at the same time, we also want to use data for uh, you know, building data products. So um, applying machine learning, um, understanding uh, our customers and influencing our customers through the, their journeys, through our experiences with data products. And doing that in a, in a more automated way, uh, in a more uh, reliable and automated way. And also, of course, those goals come into play that we are a startup, everything is to be fast, everything is to be also incremental. We don't have the luxury of, let's say, we stop everything and we build a new data platform for six months. We need to continue to deliver along the way and eventually, hopefully, ending up at um, kind of a future-proof architecture. So the good news is that Spark itself described I mean, his architecture, his platform as, um, as aligned and unified. So unified engine across data sources works so as an environment that, that looks awesome. And the question is, is that really true? Is that, does that really work? And I ask myself the same question when I look at this for the first time. And it turns out that a lot of people say something different. So I picked this from a, um, a, a deck from Cloudera. And what struck me in that deck is really that Spark is one column. Uh, it's like one tool, and it follows this mantra of pick the right tool for the right job, right? But there's also this audience line, so there's really like one tool for the ETL developers, one tool for the business analyst, one tool for the data engineers and data scientists. Um, and I sort of highlighted in, in, uh, in red what I found that actually I need, what are the strengths that I need in each of these tools. And in the industry, we have this uh, conversation around, you know, the data engineer, you know, use this type of tools, and then the data scientists use these type of tools, and data analysts use these type of tools. For example, data analysts rely on SQL, but data engineers want to code. So, the the question I really wanted to answer with Spark is that I actually want it all. I want one platform to support all of these use cases. Why should I uh, you know, invest in data pipes and replicating my data across multiple systems when one platform can actually support it all? 
And there are actually three reasons that I found um, to really justify why Spark has uh, really delivered on that front. The first one is around um, how easy it is to, to, um, to query the data in an interactive fashion. So when you ask something simple to your data, it doesn't kick off like a MapReduce job that takes, uh, you know, there's huge overhead. If you ask just a number of record count or something very simple, you will get usually a small runtime. So as a user, it feels that if I'm asking something complex, it will take time, but if I'm asking something simple, it will return the, res the result right away. That's a fundamental uh, improvement compared to Hive, for example. At the same time, Spark has a very rich API and standardized, so you don't have to use uh, a tons of other libraries to move something from uh, prototype to production. Um, you can really take um, the code that you write to write your prototype and eventually make it better to production. You don't have to take some code in R and then migrate to something else in order to move it to production. Um, and finally, Spark has invested a lot in interoperability. So other tools can connect to it. You have uh, open data formats and uh, connectors. So that fundamentally, um, it, I found are the reason why actually we could onboard with Spark right away without having to do anything else. So that's, that's kind of the fundamental behind Spark that um, kind of justify its use for our use case. There's also in this section, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about sort of like the components and the architecture that we ended up with. So when I think about big data platform, I usually think about a lot of different tools. And it, the reality, yes, there are a lot of tools and they are extremely useful, um, but there's also a lot of data pipes in between. It's complex. While as uh, with my MVP mindset, what I really want is sort of like out of the box. I want to download the data platform and start using it. Of course, that net doesn't exist. Um, but still, the, um, that's what I was looking for. Um, so I, I found this tool, maybe you know it, Databricks, that uh, runs in the cloud. Um, it, it, it followed that promise of an MVP mindset where I could easily uh, set something up and uh, improve it. So Databricks was created by the, it's, it's a, a startup uh, in San Francisco that w was created by the founders of Spark. And it's really easy, it sits on top of AWS. It's really easy to kick off a Spark cluster, run something on it, um, you know, turn it off when you don't need it anymore. So that, that attracted me at the first place. And while digging into it a little bit more, I realized that they, they, they actually approach the problem in a very um, kind of consistent uh, view. So um, Databricks has notebooks. With notebooks, you can easily get started. You can just run a few queries. You don't need to um, understand anything about compile or build or packages to just run a query. That's actually quite important. You can do analysis with notebooks, with visualization. Then your um, ETL can be supported by another functionality uh, that they call jobs. That's where you can upload jars and libraries, uh, automate things. They also have a dashboard component. It's that simple. It's not very sophisticated, but it does attract uh, you know, a certain type of users uh, um, to do a certain type of use cases. And finally, um, there's an API. So every time I have some uh, request to the D Databricks guys, they, they, they reply to me, like, use the API, and um, that actually is true, that the API is quite open and you can do pretty much uh, a lot of integration and automation through that. But it also has a user interface, of course. Um, so a while ago, our architecture looked like this. Um, so there's a, a certain amount of data sources, um, kind of logs and production databases uh, that went through uh, a Pentaho ETL process but that didn't scale uh, further, so it, it took a very long time, and that uh, architecture didn't support that sort of data science use cases. You can do query, you can do analysis, but you can't really model things in that way. So what we, what we have today is, um, is sort of an infrastructure where you have still the data warehouse around using PostgreSQL, but we also have a Spark uh, cluster sitting on Databricks, and what I want to highlight on this architecture, there are actually three fundamental data pipes that actually makes this possible. The first one is the, the, the number one on this, because you, you can't really migrate to a new data platform from one day to another. You need the migration strategy. So it, Spark can very easily pull data from uh, databases using JDBC. It's not amazing, but it works. Uh, so it was really easy for us to take some of the tables we have on the data warehouse, put them on Spark immediately and work with it. Um, the second important um, 
uh, link and pipe is the, is the number two where you do have the ability to take a final result from Spark, a table, and push it back to the data warehouse. So maybe you, st you still have some report running there that you, don't, you haven't uh, a chance to migrate yet. You can offload some of the uh, you know, heavy computation on data warehouse into Spark and then move on. And finally, we're using this uh, BI analytics tool called Looker. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, it actually does connect to Spark as well. So at this moment, we do have sort of like these two infrastructure running in parallel, and we are able to sort of like nicely move away from the data warehouse into Spark uh, step by step. Um, to give you some context of what we've been able to do with Spark in about a, you know, 365 days, I highlighted three kind of different use cases. The first one is uh, pretty simple. You do have a search application. There's lots of, uh, of our users looking for things to do when they go, for example, in Rome. That uh, these logs uh, need to be processed, uh, and um, that usually it needs code, right? So you need to be able to, use, in our case, Scala code in order to manage the data and like deal with all the complexity of parsing, and then on top of that, you have a matrix computation layer, which is SQL. Um, what was cool about Spark is that we could easily change the metrics that we wanted to, to calculate and just run the analysis on like, you know, two years of data. That would take like 20 minutes versus on Data Warehouse, just doing a query on one day of data would take, you know, minutes as well. So sort of just this idea of big archive just running through the data every time you change the computation, uh, you just recompute everything is very, uh, very uh, flexible. The second use case I wanted to highlight is uh, around performance management. We do have a lot of uh, uh, keywords, and we do work a lot with Google AdWords. Um, what used to be uh, a process on an on-premise server that we refreshed once a week, uh, we started to do that twice a day at hundreds, hundreds of size of the data. So what we, use, uh, uh, what we discovered along the way is that this data is very valuable, and the number of use cases that um, that we were able to add on top of uh, that data uh, kind of like multiplied over time. So just by having a really easy access to the data, sort of like it unleashed innovation in the organization. Finally, um, I talked a little bit about that idea of offloading things from the data warehouse to Spark in a graceful way. Uh, we were able to take logs, enrich them, and push them back to the data warehouse uh, you know, in, while still working on uh, migrating the final reports. At this point, you may ask yourself, what kind of storage did you guys use? What is the, um, you know, the solution there? Um, so when it comes to storage, you do have uh, anticipated pains where you need to sort of like standardize on a, on a certain format. Uh, the cost could get out of control. And of course, if you don't have a good uh, storage methodology, maybe Spark will get slow over time. Our solution was to build a data lake, pretty popular these days. Um, so the philosophy there is quite known. Uh, it basically stores everything and makes it very accessible. What was, uh, so Databricks already worked quite well with S3. So this is the tool that we chose. And you may ask why S3 and not HDFS. Uh, there's a couple of uh, interesting blog posts around that. S3 actually is much cheaper than HDFS when uh, um, all things considered. And it also has uh, um, very large operational gains, right? So you, you have security and, and, and management for free. You do have um, a, a nice uh, decoupling between your storage layer and your computation layer. So when you start to roll out Spark in an organization, maybe you start with a few nodes uh, with one use case, and over time you have much, much more needs. So in that case, you, just, you don't need to constantly work on your HDFS cluster. And um, as part of this data lake, we standardized around the parquet format, which both uh, ensure good compression for long-term storage, but also very good uh, uh, performance for uh, Spark application because it's a columnar format. And also, um, Sparks make it, make it really, really easy because it does really have that um, uh, equality between files and tables plus metadata. But it's really, um, you know, one, you can have hundreds and hundreds of tables on your data lake, and that is basically files into your storage. You don't have to maintain anything live. And of course, S3 has an amazing ecosystem around it. So storage is one thing, but um, one other component that I learned along the way was that you really need to um, work on your data clutter. And um, 
figure out solutions in order to find the data because at the end of the day your users will uh, you know need to use this system so how do you make sure that they uh, they find the right data and their data is clean I mean one tool that we haven't implemented but that I wanted to highlight here is um, Airbnb's data portal um, it came out relatively recently but the general vision I, I really agree with it is um, kind of making the metadata around all of your data in your data lake accessible in a way that uh, people can understand it. So you can search into a portal and find which table contains which columns and get the right documentation about that column, for example. These are sort of, sort of the things that we, we would like to do in the future. But definitely already at our uh, level, what are the things that we can do to organize the data in a better way? At the end, when I think about the, um, that platform, um, I found that we need to find a balance between premature optimization, which is sort of like choosing a very heavyweight platform and investing in infrastructure, but also, uh, on the other hand, avoiding chaos, where you start to bring something on board and people start to use it, and then you have to support it and maintain it, and it gets out of control. Spark being uh, actually open source uh, and standard um, does uh, really help on that front. So let's now that I talked a little bit about the platform, I wanted to emphasize some uh, people topics with our kind of like how we rolled out that system into the organization. Of course, um, what, there are some challenges with that because every new tool um, um, you know, creates some fear, of course. Uh, we had about like maybe you know, 10, 20 data users uh, that we could identify as uh, early uh, adopters. And the, in, in that process, you want to sort of like make them really empowered so they can access the data. They don't need a crutch. Um, and also, most of our users uh, actually did a quick survey before that talk. Most of our users were not uh, familiar with Spark before or maybe even with big data concepts. So how can we provide to our users uh, within the organization clean data so that they can innovate um, and kind of build things very quickly? So a couple lessons learned in, the, in that area. One is what I already said, making the data warehouse table uh, ver that people already know, make them accessible to, on Spark uh, very quickly, and also make that process very fast. Don't like create this system where uh, people have to rec you know, add a ticket and the ticket sits into a backlog for like you know, two weeks and then someone adds the table. Just find a way to do that very quickly at the beginning. That g brings a lot of trust and help people on board on Spark very quickly. Um, also, of course, uh, providing some training and examples. It turns out that if you provide uh, example in Scala to people that never program in Scala, they end up being Scala developers. Uh, amazing. Um, some not to. Um, once you start to onboard uh, to Spark some of those data sources, like events, you realize that ah, they are not so good, they are not so well structured. You want to kind of play with them. You want to change things, but you need at the same time to onboard the data for people to use it as soon as possible. And at the same time, you're trying to change the source. That's kind of hard, especially because usually to do any meaningful analysis, you need to go long, back long in the future. So the lesson there is just swallow it, take your old crappy logs, clean them and make them available rather than uh, reinv reinventing them right away. Of course, data quality uh, is hard. Numbers don't match between systems. Um, and another thing that uh, we found difficult is uh, libraries. So when you do, um, you know, at, at first we didn't know maybe we can provide Python and Scala libraries, but it turns out that's too much work. Uh, sort of a lot of copy pasting of common functions ha started to happen between different use cases. Um, at the end, one thing that honestly surprised me was that uh, did a quick survey again between the users within the company. It's actually not that hard to learn Spark. So that was one of the things that um, was surprising. Most people said it was rather the same as any other tool. So now that you've onboarded your users and you do have uh, um, something in place, uh, some data to play with, some uh, example of use cases, the hard work sort of starts and you, you know, just looking back at the usage of Spark, um, um, this is actually a, a cost chart. So of course, uh, uh, these things cost money. But the, after the exploration phase and the onboarding phase, you, you need to start to optimize things because otherwise you end up in that chaos that I was talking about. So a couple of challenges, I'm, not, I'm sure we were not the only one uh, uh, tackling them, but 
of course, your cluster is going to crash or is not going to work. What do you do about it? How do you get better at, at, at this? Because people start to really uh, have production use cases uh, uh, running on it. Understanding uh, root causes, understanding dependencies. I think there was a, a couple of other talks talking about this, this problem of data dependencies. Definitely very important. So on the cluster administration, your driver is, uh, is going to crash. You're going to lose executors. And it's kind of hard to understand sometimes why especially when you have like 20 concurrent users running all sorts of things. Um, so one thing that we did uh, is to build a connector to, to Datadog. Um, we found that it's kind of hard to estimate the real capacity. I mean, one cool thing about uh, Databricks is that it provides auto-scaling capabilities, so it will, it will be able to analyze your load and um, bring more nodes or less nodes depending on the load. Uh, that didn't exist at first, but uh, it's a very interesting feature. So you don't really have to do a lot of work in order to administrate your cluster. Uh, for us, we run a, a development cluster during the business hours, uh, but we can also basically continue at night, uh, but auto-scaling just basically kill most of the executors. Debugging inquiries, um, you know, applications will fail, um, and often it's related to memory problems, but you, you, it manifests itself through all sorts of exceptions. Uh, I found uh, the Spark user interface mostly useless, to be honest. Uh, this nice uh, DAGs sort of like go back a lot to the RDDs concept, but it turns out that 95% of our use cases are by now data sets, so we don't actually use the uh, RDDs almost at all. So it's really hard to understand uh, the root cause of problem with Spark, especially compared to Hadoop. And so uh, there's some learning curve in how to use that UI as well. Um, then one thing that once you start to really get real and, and serious about this, um, we wanted to migrate one of our uh, log processing workflow, which uh, was uh, back then um, put on Pentaho. And um, that legacy solution is mostly configuration. The, the Pentaho ETL uh, data integration, is you're configuring, and, 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 and it's actually relatively easy to test. So migrating that to Spark, um, um, means transforming that into actual code, not very sophisticated code, but code that can be tested. And, of, and with that comes data quality challenges, and you need to invest into different tools and techniques in order to compare your previous data sets um, with your new data sets. And of course, numbers rarely match. That said, we developed that Scala library to, uh, um, to, to manage our ETL, and that was easy to unit test, that was easy to benchmark as well. So it was, it was definitely a step in the right direction. And because Spark, um, you really have that sort of unlimited storage, you can do cool things such as tracking the list of errors you have for e every single row of data, uh, just along with the same uh, data set, in order to do statistics about what kind of new edge cases has appeared in your logs. Another uh, important theme uh, is data lineage. So when you do uh, start to have uh, dozens of tables depending on each other, you start to need uh, uh, some kind of tool. And um, people will start depending on your, on your different tables and so on. Um, and it's also relatively inefficient. So um, Spar uh, Databricks, you can create as many clusters as you want. And when you create a job, you do, uh, you can you know, set it up on a new cluster. So we ended up having uh, dozens of small clusters running more or less at the same time for batch jobs. That's not very efficient. So with a, um, with a tool to orchestrate your workflow, you will be capable maybe to create a, 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 small, a small, like a medium-sized cluster at first, uh, put a bunch of parallel jobs at the same time. Uh, once they're done, just kill the cluster. So for that, we started working with uh, Apache Airflow. There are other tools uh, out there, uh, like Rigi, for example. Airflow is very flexible, and um, it's, you can just, it's Python code. You can just hack it, basically, to do whatever you want. And it, it does actually have a, um, a Databricks component, so you can, and the Airflow system itself is just a, a, you know, a, a director of the orchestra. That nothing actually runs on that box, but it gives, uh, an order to the Databricks API to run job X, or it gives an order to the uh, PostgreSQL data warehouse to run query Y. Yes, a lot of cool features, and we are still more or less at the beginning at the moment to kind of bring uh, the, the various data processes into, into this tool. But it looks very promising. 
Um, quick, um, so that, that, that section lead, lead me to one of the uh, very interesting learning for me uh, coming from maybe from an engineering background, notebook didn't really feel very natural to me, but I learned to, to like them. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of you know, my uh, learnings there. So in Databricks, a notebook look like this. You can run uh, Scala, Python, R, and SQL code. Um, it, it also has some uh, relatively nice visualization components with uh, bar chart and, and so on. Um, you can nicely see tables, uh, and your code um, lives in an environment that can be shared. So notebooks can be visible to each other. They can, uh, uh, you can work on the same notebook with your colleagues. Not anything different from IPython notebook for the most part, but every notebook basically runs stuff on Spark instead. Some uh, interesting advantages, obvious. Uh, it's more iterative um, to do uh, exploratory data analysis. Easy to collaborate, as I said, and there's also, of course, open source solutions. You can use uh, Apache, Zeppelin, uh, on top of your own uh, Spark um, cluster to do more or less the same things. Um, but the, the cool thing, and the not so cool thing about notebooks, is you can also do a lot of other things. So that's when the sort of like the big data elephant jumps the fence and start running. You can run notebooks as part of other notebooks, or you can um, use um, notebooks as part of the API and try to automate that. And you can even run uh, multiple notebooks in multiple threads, uh, which end up creating all sorts of problems. So the bottom line there is really that production workflows need something else than notebooks. Uh, they, 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 they're good for experimentation, but we learned that uh, pretty quickly that they won't scale. Um, and it, what at the end we need is a notebook, a machine learning workflow is always more or less um, you know, looking like a succession of a lot of different steps. So we need the ability to map those different uh, components, some kind of global configuration, uh, proper revision history, uh, and the ability to control error handling and logging and so on. So um, for that, there's not a lot of... Uh, um, kind of like predefined solutions and there's like a kind of a whole craft around um, how to build production workflows the right way. Uh, with, the, and with, with Spark, it does um, give you a lot of the box, especially compared to um, what was there before. Like for Spark allows you to do uh, a, you know, unit tests. It's relatively easy to, to get, um, to, to separate your developer environment between your production environment. In the old days of Hadoop, like just having a cluster running locally was a pain in the ass. Uh, that on Spark really is not a problem anymore. So um, I think we moved a, lo uh, a long way from, from those days um, where you do uh, need it to really try, iterate a lot of times, look at the logs, upload your jar again, and so on and so on. It's easier to run uh, things locally. So that, that's uh, for my talk. Um, I hope that was uh, useful. If you are thinking about um, moving to Spark, this is uh, my experience. Of course, there's a lot of other uh, ways to, uh, to build a data platform. Um, there are uh, a lot of components that I haven't talked about, but uh, I hope this playbook was, uh, uh, was interesting. Um, I open for questions and from the audience. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, do you have questions for Matthew? Hi there. Yeah, very, very simple question, really. You talked a lot about how you scale up and down. How do you control the infrastructure cost on Databricks and the rest of your infrastructure? So the question on uh, controlling the cost, I mean, we are still early on in a way that um, there is, we all more or less know what people are running still. So it's not like another department is gonna suddenly, uh, you know, do something crazy and, and, and you will sort of see the bill at the end of the month. So um, with uh, Airflow, we, want, we don't wanna be a bottleneck in a way that you have like one 
graph where you, you know, if you, if you want to add a new process, you will need to integrate with that graph. But still, we want to provide some kind of sandbox environment and, and um, onboarding so any developer can create their own DAG and execute it on, on, on the cluster. So there, uh, I think we can uh, give um, that environment so we are actually able to monitor these things. Um, so that's the first thing, and then um, if, if we run into individual trouble, we'll, we will just get deeper into optimizing Spark workflows because there's a lot of things you can do. I, I would say compared to the Hadoop days, the, the time I spend on digging into configuration and JVM or garbage collector craziness is definitely very low. So it's improved a lot from that, but there's always things you can do to improve your, your workflows. I must say that as we work a lot with the Dataset API, um, you do not have that many levers except changing basically your um, kind of like logic or your business logic. Uh, maybe um, using more caching. I, I've been in a lot of those conversations. When do you cache? Uh, um, what is the impact of caching? So essentially, we actually, I'm actually looking forward to have uh, you know cost overload from uh, uh, from the the users. That means that we've comp we've really created new use cases that we haven't had before. Um, so far, I would say we're still at a scale where we can control most uh, of, of what people are doing, or at least we see what they're doing. Other questions? Yeah, I, I have one. Um, so get your guide. What kind of data do you process with Spark? Um, so we have a lot of marketing data. That is, I would say, maybe the area where the, the big data component is the most prominent. Uh, because, you know, in marketing, especially performance marketing, you have impressions, you have clicks, every single thing is tracked. That creates a lot of data. Um, so we process uh, a, a lot of that data. And then we have... Um, Mostly events, basically, like what, thing, what people are doing when they use the, uh, the website or the applications um, in, in uh, a large amount of details. And um, also in a way that we can use it to build uh, machine learning models. So, for example, when you do have um, um, a search uh, query, we log what we know about the search, the environment, uh, what were the list of products that we considered as being relevant, which one was actually served, which one was clicked on, uh, and so on and so on. So um, you, do, you do have a lot of this structured um, JSON-like data with a schema uh, where the producer of the data, for example, the search service would control that schema. And um, that, uh, on top of that, I would say the, most of the performance marketing data is, is um, also Simple structure, not so nested, um, but a lot of a lot uh, of rows. Any questions from the audience? Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.